All right, Dr. Lawman, I'm ready to go if you are. I am. Uh, I have the recording on, so we're ready to go. All right, fantastic. All right, everybody. So thanks again for joining us on this final session of the Cattle Health webinar series. Uh, our Ranchers Thursday lunchtime series has uh, has been really good, I think, uh, really from the very beginning, and we appreciate you being on um, on today. So uh, I did have a question, um, looks like from Jack Wallace, um, a little bit. Uh, the question was, did I take Dr. Thedford's role? Dr. Thedford did have an outreach role at, uh, at here at the, the College of Veterinary Medicine, and so that, that falls in my lane these days. So uh, for those of you all that don't know me, I'm Rosalind Biggs. Uh, I am a veterinarian with, uh, with OSU Extension uh, as a beef cattle extension specialist, as well as the Director of Continuing Education with the College of Veterinary Medicine. I am an, an OSU grad through and through. Uh, I got my bachelor's in Ag Econ uh, in 2001 and then finished up vet school in, in 2004. I then went into mixed practice in, I went back home to uh, the Chickasha area and uh, was in mixed practice there at Cimarron Veterinary Services and Verdon Veterinary Clinic at that time. I then moved uh, to the USDA and uh, on really to the other side of the state, I was stationed in Shakota as a veterinary medical officer with APHIS Veterinary Services. Uh, I then, uh, I was in that role for I guess just about 11, 10 or 11 years. And uh, then I took a, a position as an assistant area veterinarian in charge dealing with international imports and exports, again with APHIS Veterinary Services covering uh, the states of Oklahoma, Texas, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. And then I came back to OSU and I'm super excited, uh, continue to really enjoy my, my role here, uh, both with Extension and the College of Vet Med. Uh, we've got a great team on, on both sides uh, of the lane for, for me. And um, we have uh, fairly recently moved to to Stillwater, I have, uh, I'm married and I have two small girls and uh, we've maintained uh, our operation in Chickasha as well as uh, have a place now here in, in Stillwater. So I think that, uh, I think that covers it uh, as far as the particulars on me and we'll get rolling here with our presentation. Give me just a minute, I'll get that pulled up. All right, here. All right, Dr. Lawman, can you see that okay? I can, looks good. All right, fantastic. Well, so uh, today I wanted to visit with you a little bit about effective veterinary client-patient relationships, and, and, and we'll talk really fairly in depth uh, as far as all of the reasons that, that we need to do this and, and things that impact both the veterinarian as well as the farmer and rancher. And, and you all know uh, many of these things, but I think it's important to, to emphasize uh, a few key points and also talk about where we are within rural veterinary medicine here in Oklahoma and then understand what the statutory definition, uh, what the legal definition here in Oklahoma is of a VCPR and what are those responsibilities of both the veterinarian and the producer. And then talk a little bit more in depth about the veterinarian and client partnership. And, and that's really how I see it is that it is a partnership based on uh, based on communication and it's gotta be, it's gotta be mutually beneficial. So I wanted to start out with, this is the veterinarian's oath, and you all can read this, uh, but each veterinary graduate upon completion of, of school uh, stands and, and says, says the oath and, and where we are. There, you'll notice um, 
Anyway, I, I read an article the other day that uh, said, be nice to your veterinarian, their education cost them a fortune and they're probably still paying for it as, uh, as many graduates do in, in a lot of different areas. And um, I just finished those student loans for myself uh, not so long ago. So um, with that, you know, we'll notice on here really the roles of, of the veterinarian, particularly we'll talk today uh, with respect to animal health and welfare and, um, and where, that, where that leads us in, in working on relationships with, with our clients. So a big focus of mine and, and something that I'm really passionate about is, is rural veterinary medicine. Um, I'm, I'm passionate about Oklahoma, Oklahoma agriculture, and specifically rural veterinary medicine. You know, I, many of you all know these statistics, but we've got, you know, 2 million beef cows in, in the state, and um, we've got about a little over 2,000 licensed uh, Oklahoma veterinarians. Now, keep in mind that you can be licensed in multiple states. Uh, I myself am licensed here in Oklahoma, but I also maintain a license in, in Missouri. So, you may have out of state uh, veterinarians that, that do come into Oklahoma uh, to practice, but I've got to be licensed in, in that specific state within those, within those borders in order to practice veterinary medicine. Uh, but with that 2000 veterinarians, and this isn't going to come as a, a big surprise to, to our producers on the line today, we, we do have um, really the best number for me to look at is where we are with accredited veterinarians because, and this is USDA accreditation, it's a, it's a voluntary program that allows your veterinarian to do things like testing for brucellosis or tuberculosis or write uh, an interstate certificate of veterinary inspection health certificate to do those, those type of activities. And uh, in, that, in that category too is uh, we look at 400, just over 480 mixed food animal practitioners uh, that would address the, the beef industry. We do know, and actually we have a, a research project uh, that involved many that you've seen on the Ranchers Thursday series, uh, including Dr. Lawman, Dr. Beck, Dr. Whitworth, Dr. Gillum, uh, a couple of weeks ago, focused on, on this shortage project. And we do encourage you, if you have a moment, uh, as you close out today, we are in the survey period of our integrated beef cattle program for veterinarians, and we are wanting uh, veterinarians, veterinary students, as well as uh, cattlemen and women to, to take a look at that and give us, give us their feedback on that survey. So the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture says we've got a type two shortage uh, and, and how they define that is veterinarians that do 12 hours uh, a week of, of food animal medicine. So we really, we understand, uh, and that's what I did in, in practice, um, it's, it's a mix, right? Uh, we'll see small animal and large animal and um, trying, to, trying to keep that balance to service a, a variety of, of clients. But uh, we're really focused on that food animal part uh, for a variety of reasons because of it's such a big, big industry here in Oklahoma. Um, but we also, that's what many of us really, uh, really love. The rest of it may help pay the bills, but uh, that's where that's where our heart is. So in, in 2019, we had 34% of Oklahoma counties identified as being rural shortage areas. And then in 2020, uh, we had an identification of 48%. And you can see these, these are the counties uh, in 2020 that were identified as um, shortage areas. And what this means is if you have a veterinarian that is that has student loans and is practicing in these areas, um, there is some veterinary loan repayment program that can uh, can help them. And so if for some reason you have a connection with them and they're not aware of the program, certainly welcome to contact me. I can get them uh, get them to the right spot. Uh, Dr. Hall, uh, Oklahoma State Veterinarian, helps uh, facilitate that uh, from the state, the state level. Where we are at OSU College of Veterinary Medicine, 
we produce uh, really more food animal, mixed animal practitioners um, at that almost 23% as we look at the last five years of, of graduates. And I don't have the 2020 numbers just yet, but um, we're, we're above that national average and that continues to be a focus, uh, not only for me, as I mentioned, but also uh, Dean Carlos Risco, who is uh, the Dean here at the College of Veterinary Medicine. So when we get to what, what defines the, the veterinary client patient relationship, it's, it's well spelled out in our Oklahoma Practice Act. And so um, I've taken that and really kind of broken it down to, to the things that uh, section by section, there's about four sections. And so for a veterinarian, we assume the responsibility uh, regarding the health of that animal and the need for treatment and the client or the owner or whomever's responsible for, the, uh, for that animal has agreed to follow the, follow the instructions. And this is Dr. Dawson, uh, one of our theriogenology, our reproductive specialist here at, uh, at the College of Veterinary Medicine. I was fortunate to have him as, a, as an instructor and fortunate to work with him now. So there is, um, when it comes to the next session, we've got to have as a veterinarian, we have to have sufficient knowledge of that specific animal or animals under the care of, of that operation, either by personal in, inspection, we've got to be acquainted with them, um, or that we're, we've been on that farm, we've been on that ranch, and we understand in, uh, in detail the, the general care of those animals. And so, we also have to, to be available um, to make those medically necessary and timely visits to the premises uh, where, where those animals can be taken a look at. And so some of these you may go, well, this is pretty vague. It doesn't really outline the specifics that my veterinarian has to be on my place, you know, every 30 days, every 60 days, every six months, or, or at least once every so often. And, and that is left up really to your specific veterinarian and, um, and your operation as to what fits that veterinarian's comfort level. Got to be available for follow-up or have um, emergency medical coverage uh, with, with that. And obviously, this probably goes without saying, but the, the veterinarian's actions have to align with federal and, and state uh, regulations. I had a question, and I think we'll, I'll go ahead and jump, on, jump at this one. The question is, would you say there's a lot of room for prospective food animal veterinarians in the job market? And I think the answer to that is, is absolutely yes. Um, I actually was working with one of our alumni coordinators uh, here at the college just this week. Um, I have, she, she sent out over, and these are, these are both small animal and large animal, and I need to get down into the, into the weeds in that a little bit and break those down, but there are jobs out there for sure for food animal veterinarians and, um, and food supply veterinarians. Uh, if, you're, if you're interested in that a little bit more um, as far as what, what the shortage area is and what the under, underserviced areas uh, are, uh, let me know. We've got a, we had a great uh, webinar, oh, probably a little over a month ago on that specific, uh, that specific area that uh, Dr. Navarre from Louisiana State put on for us. And so, um, it is, is one of those things that we definitely need to take care of. I've got another question as what counts as a veterinary shortage on, on a county basis. That, that parameter varies on um, where, uh, where they are and what, what the need is. And that's really determined by, uh, there are no set standards in answer to that question. That's determined by Dr. Hall when he, when he submits those. And so um, he may take a look at how many veterinarians are, are in that area. Are there veterinarians that uh, have been in that area, are established and could benefit from it? And so, um, you know, we, we've been very fortunate with that veterinary loan repayment program here in Oklahoma to get those dollars back to Oklahoma in, in the hands of veterinarians in those shortage areas, uh, much in part because of how uh, Dr. Hall has worked with those, those communities and um, 
really identified those particular counties that could benefit from the program. So, and I think that that particular point is, is really important that we do have, um, we can have veterinarians that, that want to go to certain areas really uh, of our state or of our country. And it's probably important too, to mention that we're not unique in Oklahoma as far as having underserviced areas. Uh, it's actually not even unique to the United States. It's, it's a global issue when it comes to food supply veterinarians that it is, um, it, it is a need. And in fact, Dean Risco uh, was scheduled to speak at an international conference. Unfortunately, it was canceled uh, related to COVID, but on that very topic. And so we're, we take it seriously and we're looking at, at options from, uh, from the side of veterinary medicine uh, here at the school on how we can address, address that issue. So when we, when we get back to that VCPR, I really want you to focus on the, uh, again, that's the veterinary client patient relationship. I want you to focus on that relationship. And it is not only a relationship of um, a veterinarian and their specific clients, but in order to be able to keep veterinarians in those areas, we really have to have communities that, that support them. Uh, whether that be a, a specific uh, community of, of producers in the area, uh, we have to be able to support uh, really all of our small businesses in rural Oklahoma, and specifically as we talk about today, veterinary practices. So I would like you to think of, of your veterinarian as a, as a team member on your management team for your operation. You've got to make sure that that veterinarian is really suitable to your operation and practice. I had a colleague uh, that was presenting at, at NCBA convention uh, last year that said, you know, if, if your cows have names, I'm probably not your, uh, not your veterinarian uh, to do the best job for you, she said, but uh, I have a veterinarian in my practice that, that that's their specialty. And so you need to find the veterinarian that uh, works with you, that has the knowledge that fits your operation and can make your operation better as, as part of that team. So I always joke, you know, the best time to develop this relationship is not at two in the morning, um, shoot side with a C-section. Uh, we we want to have these conversations well in advance of, of emergencies or before we get into a train wreck. Um, you know, that is sometimes how these relationships starts and, and that's okay if, uh, if that's how it develops, but it continues, you need to continue beyond that, that emergency in my mind. It's got to be founded in, in communication. I do want to encourage you to, to think about you know, written VCPRs, they really establish the expectations for, for you as the, the client, as the producer, as well as the veterinarian so that we can see where we're trying to go uh, with, with the operation well beyond that, that single cow that's maybe in the chute or the single animal that we're, we're treating there. Communication as we're, we've dealt with uh, with a pandemic this year has then gone, you know, much more virtual. Uh, these, this series itself is a, is a product of, uh, of just that. And we're, we've got to take advantage of, uh, of, the, of the benefits that go with that. And so is your communication always face-to-face -face or is it over the phone or are we utilizing other virtual means, uh, whether that be, you know, video conferencing or, or even text messages. Um, it, we can have any of that that, that meets the need in, in cer under certain circumstances, but that communication has got to be uh, both ways. And we're really looking for these relationships to be mutually beneficial, as I said. We've got to have the community of, of producers, the community of clients that's willing to support a veterinary practice, um, but the veterinarian also has to be in a situation to provide increased profitability to our operations and um, making sure that the veterinary practice along with um, those operations that support that practice, that they're both, um, they're both sustainable for the long haul. So why now more than ever? And we're gonna we're gonna buzz through this fairly fairly quickly. And so, um, if you have questions after the fact or, or you have additional conversation, feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email. I'll be happy to um, to take a look at these. So, when it comes to animal health, 
we really need to have these VCPRs when it comes to herd health protocols. Within veterinary medicine, we are seeing uh, a movement, and you'll see the, the bullet point on here, um, for that veterinarian to be a herd health consultant advisor, um, really dealing with issues before there's an issue versus always, um, you know, our, our, our really our traditional um, focus has been really what we call fire engine medicine is that we're just taking care of those emergencies as they as they come at us. And so we need to take a look at what are the things we can do well in advance? What are those, again, mutually beneficial relationships, mutually beneficial communication to allow producers and veterinarians to, to both be successful? Um, you take a look at your herd health protocols and, and think about this, you know, do you have a written protocol for uh, what, what you're doing as far as vaccination schedule, um, what you're doing for parasites? We've talked a little bit about those uh, in this series, and so putting it in writing is uh, is a great idea, and, and that, I think, um, one of the advantages to being committed to putting in writing is that that requires a communication, that requires a conversation to occur as to what fits your specific operation. Um, that also goes for disease, disease treatments, and uh, what we talked with uh, Dr. Jones last week about what are we going to do if we suspect uh, we've got foot rot? What are the characteristics that would, um, if we had foot rot in a herd, and how are we going to treat that? And then when are we going to to step beyond that, and uh, have protocols, those those standard operating procedures, so to speak, in place, um, developed with you and your veterinarian and, and your team as well, um, to to make sure that that makes sense for you. Uh, I think that probably goes for medication selection and usage, and and we'll talk a little bit more about residues and, and where we are going as far as consumer preferences and requirements that we all have to, to operate in. Um, you know, if you're fortunate to have a nutritionist on your team, I think that is fantastic. And, um, you know, how that plays between, uh, we've got a lot of herd health that is focused on, on nutrition um, and how that plays into uh, veterinarian's role as well. And then again, um, things that we, we commonly think about as far as genetic recommendations um, and so on. Also don't wanna miss uh, biosecurity. That's a big topic for me. And I think one we really need to, to focus on more because I think if we can think about biosecurity, not only does it protect us from the next bullet in line, that emerging disease threat or foreign animal disease diseases, but it can also, impact positively our, our bottom line and help us in areas like um, antibiotic stewardship if we're able to really include the biosecurity practices to help us with good husbandry. Um, we also want to have, we, we need to have that VCPR for emergency services, right? And um, we can't just use we can't just have a, a practice solely based on emergency services in many areas. It's just frankly not sustainable. So you want to have that relationship because many veterinarians, uh, if you're not an existing client, uh, you and, and you contact them, uh, that may be additional fees um, related to those emergency services. So, so don't forget that aspect too. Um, and then what are your management strategies? How is your, how is your team on the operation uh, working? Fully recognizing that the team may be, may be just you and your spouse or you and your kids. Um, but we also wanna think about things that veterinarians bring to the table as far as assessing management strategies and, uh, and record keeping as well. So we, um, we had this developed through extension and um, uh, Marty New sent it to me yesterday. I wanted to make sure we uh, we alerted this. We'll put this in the in the chat as we as we finish up today. Um, but these are the kind of documents I think that can really uh, keep us within the bounds of our veterinary client patient relationship can keep us within the bounds of what we're supposed to be doing as far as items uh, when it comes to antibiotic stewardship. It can also get us um, get us a plan, get us straight with how we're going to treat um, certain certain conditions, and it's the documentation piece of it. Um, particularly if we were to be evaluated or there was to be a residue in, in um, an animal that came from my operation, I want to have those records that are the 
that take care of me, that protect me, that say, nope, this is what I gave the animal. This is where I worked with my veterinarian. And um, this, is, this is the date and time, et cetera. So veterinarians also, this VCPR can improve animals' well-being when it comes to your operation. What are our standards of care? And, and as an industry, if I'm a producer, am I maintaining the, the standards of care? Am I handling pain management like I, like I should be? What, what are the industry standards? Veterinarians do a very good job of, of keeping up to speed with those and encouraging you to incorporate those practices. We've already talked a little bit about management practices, treatment protocols. Um, I think it's Im important to also recognize that euthanasia protocols fill in to animal well-being and um, if we have end of life decisions for, for that particular animal, um, what, is, what is that gonna look like and are we doing it in, in an acceptable manner? We also, um, there's various programs out there for humane handling and care and uh, veterinarians can offer some resources to you when it comes to program certifications. So I encourage you today, hopefully you're maybe jotting down a few notes that you want to, to go with uh, to your veterinarian to um, encourage you to have these kind of conversations well in advance. Um, we also need to recognize that we have regulatory changes uh, generally at the, at the federal level that, that push us um, together as veterinarians and clients. And, and many of that is, is based on extra label drug use when we have a condition in an animal, a food producing species in particular, that uh, we need to be, need, we need to treat for a particular condition, but maybe there's not a medication that's labeled for that. You need to be under, um, again, it's that food safety role there. You need to be un make sure you've got all the I's dotted and T's crossed uh, under veterinary supervision when you, when you do those things. Everybody's probably very familiar with veterinary feed directive and um, the implications that had for, for the industry. I will tell you that um, I don't think any veterinarians were super excited to have to write one more more document and so um you know there there was lots of grumbling out there as far as it's just one more thing for veterinarians to uh to, to add add to their their list add to the bill at the end of the month or or that particular visit and i don't think that's frankly the case because it's not it's not fun for us and i will tell you when it comes to to veterinarians, I don't know any of them that got into the profession to, in hopes that they were going to be, uh, going to be rich. So, um, we also want to talk about, and it's probably important if you're not already aware, the continued discussion with FDA. And I have not seen um, there was supposed to be a report out in September. Uh, I didn't take the take a moment to look on the FDA site before the presentation today to know where we are with that. But there's continued discussion about removing any are over-the-counter antibiotics and putting those back under veterinary prescriptions. And so you want to keep in mind when it comes to animal welfare, we want to have, we want to have the options to treat, treat those animals and um, balancing that with say, food safety and residues. And that's where those two things can, can meet is your veterinarian to make sure that you have the availability, you can have those prescriptions to, to treat those animals accordingly. Um, other topics that uh, are worth considering are animal disease traceability and the veterinarian's role in assisting uh, producers in, in getting that traceability. And then I think it's important too to recognize when it comes to trade, uh, particularly international trade as well as interstate trade, uh, Probably everybody on the line today is familiar with uh, health certificates or certificates of veterinary inspection. We have those, um, the international health certificates as well for animals as well as animal products. Our trading partners have certain expectations and the veterinarian uh, is, is considered that expert in animal health and well-being. And when it comes to um, diseases and validity proof that we're not um, transferring diseases or transferring conditions or have those residues uh, in if we're talking animal products um, that's where the veterinarian veterinarian plays a role and that helps keep our our trade going so we've got to these days particularly if we're in the beef industry we can't we can't leave out our consumer expectations and 
you know, consumers, retailers, and, and, and processors have, have confidence in, in veterinarians and, and their assessment. And um, it's also, we've got some interesting research coming out of our, our Ag Econ group, in, in my opinion, as to uh, what consumers' willingness to pay for a number of our practices uh, in the beef industry. And so I encourage you to maybe take a look at that. Dr. Burr has some really good stuff coming up with that. Um, we also, our consumers uh, expect, expect safe, healthy, and frankly affordable um, protein when it comes to the beef industry. And we wanna be able to, to provide that. And um, as we've mentioned before too, antibiotic stewardship is, is really a consumer expectation uh, that we've got to be paying attention to. So I wanted to list this, this is the American Association of Bovine Practitioners, what their recommended components are for, for a VCPR. And this fairly recently, um, they, they've revised these recommendations here in March, 2020, but for operations, um, they recommend, of course, that you have a veterinarian of record and, and that you have that uh, veterinarian of record document and, and that it's a written agreement. Again, that really lays out what the expectations are from both the producer side of things, but also the veterinarian side of things. And it helps start that conversation in my mind to make sure that you have the right fit for your operation when it comes to the veterinarian that you're choosing. So it's, again, it clarifies those relationships. It's also important to identify any other relationships on that management team and where those intersect within veterinary medicine. We wanna be able to provide those written protocols that we've already mentioned. And we want to ensure that either written or electronic treatment records are, are maintained. Um, we want to as well be able to provide the drugs or prescriptions for specific timeframes, under specific protocols. So with that, I've, I've hit it fairly fast. I, I tried to keep us right at that, right at that 30 minutes, but if you have any questions, um, certainly feel free to, to put those in the chat. Uh, I think what we'll do at this point is we're gonna go ahead and launch our, launch our poll. And if you have a moment, uh, feel free to, to take that Take that poll. Are there any ad additional questions? I think maybe we had one here. All right, so we've got some good numbers coming in and, and we'll share these in, in just a minute. Yeah, so I had a question about would, would I be willing to talk about any tips for students looking to enter a food animal veterinary field? I, I, absolutely. Um, I, I seem to have a, um, a, a student, uh, that I visit with, it, it seems uh, at least every week or, or every other week. And, I, and I'm happy, um, actually, I, I really enjoy visiting with, uh, with students that are interested in, in entering food animal medicine. You know, the, the tips I have for those students are to make sure that uh, from the get-go, they are really understand the field of veterinary medicine. I encourage them to Find a, find a veterinary practitioner that they can either work for or shadow and, and, and make sure they understand what they're getting into. Because as I mentioned, it's, you know, most of our, most, the average student debt for our, our veterinary graduates here at Oklahoma State University is about 150,000 um, when they, when they complete veterinary school. And we have, uh, the national average is about 160,000. We're still working to keep it, uh, to keep OSU as, a, as affordable as we can be. Um, the advantage to those students in Oklahoma is that they are considered in-state students. And so that application pool is much smaller. And so that, in, that improves their, their odds uh, of being accepted. But they've really got to understand 
um, what, what they're looking at as far as um, starting salaries and, and how they're gonna be able to service that debt. They also need to understand uh, that for any of us in the beef industry, um, that it's hard work, that it's not, uh, not always glamorous and um, understand how that uh, plays with work-life balance with, um, as, you, as you move forward uh, in, in your life. And so I, I encourage them to, to soak up and get as much veterinary experience as they can before they apply. Now, of course, they have to have uh, solid, solid grades as well. Uh, when it comes to that, and, and if you're interested in those specifics, I encourage you to take a look at um, vetmed.okstate.edu. That has our statistics really from our, our most recent class. And you don't have to be perfect. Um, I, I think that's a really a misnomer. It, it's not all 4.0 students that are being, being accepted, um, but they are looking for students that are strong academically that will be able to uh, withstand the, the rigors of veterinary school and um, be able to, to handle, handle that academic load. Uh, but they're also looking for students that are well-rounded, um, that will be contributors to, to their communities and, and to society. So um, you can probably tell that's a really long answer to your question. Uh, it, it, can be, it can be complicated, but the key there is um, work hard, and uh, get that veterinary experience and keep your grades up strong and and that will prove uh, those those things prove well uh, generally for students that are interested in uh, entering veterinary school so uh, I did have a question is there a list of mobile veterinary practices for the state we don't have a really a comprehensive list um, put together for for ambulatory practices we do offer ambulatory services here at the College of Veterinary Medicine. Actually, Do Dr. Gillum, that you may have heard, uh, heard from if you sat in on the first two sessions of this series is, our, uh, is responsible for our ambulatory services in large part. And so, um, but there are a number of practices and if you're looking for recommendations in, in your areas, you're always welcome to contact uh, the licensing board, keeps veterinarians in your area and can give you specifics um, for uh, for veterinarians that may be able to assist uh, assist you there. Uh, I think the key thing and one of the items that we're really looking for in this integrated beef cattle program uh, research uh, and then project with veterinarians is, you know, really putting some numbers to uh, the question that was asked earlier. What What is the level of the underservice? What really constitutes a county needing need or an area needing need? And um, what what are veterinarians faced with? What are their what does their practice area look like? Is it in the, all of Southwest Oklahoma? Uh, we certainly have some that that do that. Um, that really have large large travel areas to to accommodate their clients. All right, Dr. Lawman, have I? I stopped our poll here. I'm going to go ahead and share those results. I have a I have a quick question for you, Dr. Biggs. Yes, sir. So I'm just curious. I mean, I recognize <clears throat> that uh, the veterinary practice is obviously, for obvious reasons, a face-to-face -face, uh, or on-site-based business. Uh, but you mentioned, you know, the opportunity, perhaps the need to move more into to management and, uh, well, just uh, assisting people with, you know, record keeping and, and planning and so on. Do you see more, um, uh, let's say, I, I, I don't know, electronic based, internet based um, type interactions in the future? I don't know how you would tie a fee to that or whatever, but uh, I'm just Absolutely. curious what you see coming. Yeah, I, I, think, our, I think our virtual world um, has been really brought to the forefront over the last six months or so, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and actually, directly to that question, a number of the licensing boards really relaxed their, their telemedicine requirements um, to allow veterinary medicine to continue, not specific just to food animal medicine, um, but that, that was utilized in small animal versus large animal medicine. I do think for those of us that are large animal practitioners is that we're probably doing more 
uh, virtual medicine than, than we realize. Um, I, I joke that I have a sister that, that lives in Kansas that I get to be the concierge veterinarian for two very spoiled bulldogs there. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's, all, that's all virtual. Uh, and oftentimes I tell her, you need to go see your, your veterinarian tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But um, I do think we, we will see a trend, uh, a growing trend into that space. And so there's, there's some factors that impact that, certainly rural broadband and connectivity impact our ability to, to do that. Um, there's also the, the, the question that becomes, um, you know, how do, how, do we, how do we charge for that? And if we've been offering those kind of services um, really free to this point, how do we then capture, capture those things if we're going to, to move into that? Um, you know, are there things like retainers that come come with it? I, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I think those of us in large animal medicine are a little bit slower uh, to embrace uh, the virtual world as uh, as compared to our small animal counter counterparts. But our small small animal counterparts, I mean, they're they have virtual committees, and um, we will. Uh, they're, they're, they're often running with it, and, and I think we'll see more of that, more of that moving forward. And, and I think there's really some advantages to it, frankly. Um, I think I've got a note from, from Dr. Whitworth, and he said he had been visiting with uh, Dr. Hall, the state veterinarian, about where the, what our changes look like. Uh, you know, we've, we've had to embrace technology that we maybe wouldn't have otherwise. Um, I'll give you a, a great example for us with continuing education is um, we, we've hosted our summer seminar and then our fall conference, uh, our veterinary continuing education will be all virtual with webinars just like this. And uh, we had some really great positive feedback um, from our practitioners, even practitioners that, that got together as um, as a practice associates or, or even friends that were in there, I guess they're in their own quarantine group at that point, right? But um, they, they found the resources where the small animal track was set up in the kitchen and the large animal track was set up on the television in the living room and they just be bopped back, uh, back and forth. So um, I think we will continue to move towards that uh, virtual space. And, and I think that's advantageous, particularly as we look at our at our producers and accessibility to veterinary services in a number of our areas. Um, I think the Oklahoma Panhandle is a great example of that, of, um, of having veterinary, veterinary need, undoubtedly. There's just not a lot of veterinarians up there. Um, and the other component that I haven't mentioned is as a, as a veterinary community, um, many of our food animal practitioners are, are approaching or are well past um, a typical retirement age. Now, many of them will probably never retire. Um, the other thing I think that's important with this, and it's a really long answer to your question, Dr. Lawman, sorry, is um, we are seeing a trend for rural practices to, to sell to corporate ownership. And with that will come different, um, I, I am interested to see that. In fact, the practice that I used to work for uh, is now under corporate ownership in, in large part, I think they, they have stayed with, with that practice, um, you know, the standards that were there before, before that transition, but how that affects us as veterinarians and how that per affects us as clients, um, it will be interesting to, to see because we've seen that in small animal medicine and there are some good things and there are some challenging things that go along with that. So uh, we've got another question I think in, in the chat as far as what about having more than one veterinarian as a resource? You know, I think, I think there, uh, I, I will tell you, I, I do that myself. Um, I've got veterinarians that, that work on for the embryo work uh, that, that happens at my house, um, that's not me because I'm, I'm paying for that expertise of, of somebody that does that day in and day out. I think that's a really um, probably easy example, but you have, you have veterinarians that have certain specialties uh, under, their, under their umbrella. And I think as far as having a, a veterinarian that is, is your one and only for everything, um, I never had a problem sending, sending clients to a specialist. I never had a problem recommending somebody else that, that could do a better job 
uh, for them in a particular area. And so I think uh, how you make that successful is the communication piece that we've already talked about, is knowing that, um, you know, hey, Dr. Biggs, uh, I know you don't, don't do embryos um, every day. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, incorporating that into my operation. Where should I go? Who would you recommend? I think that's a good, good way to, to start it because you also might found, may find by having those communications, your veterinarian has a broader skill set than you even knew. Um, and, but it also may lead you to, uh, to expertise that, uh, where you can be most successful. I guess I'm I'm impressed and a little surprised at the uh, your poll results here that that me would consider a valid relationship and uh, that high percentage keeping records. Yeah, it's that's very very encouraging to me, and it's higher than than I expected. So um, I'm I applaud you all that uh, that have joined us today because it's it looks like. Uh, you're, you're really doing the things you need to do to be successful in your operation. Uh, we did have one other question in the Q&A. Uh, it's, do you think that large animal veterinary medicine is as physically demanding as it used to be, or has there been a noticeable push towards work smarter, not harder to help the overall well-being of veterinarians? I think that's a great question. Um, I, I do think undoubtedly large animal medicine is is physically demanding and I don't think that probably probably goes away it's pretty easy to uh, identify the large animal practitioners at a veterinary meeting because um, we may not uh, we may not walk or we, we won't pass the lameness evaluation very well it seems um, but with that, I do think there is technology. Many of you all may be familiar with um, uh, a movement uh, to use ultrasound uh, probes that don't require, uh, for palpation, that don't require, um, you know, potential injuries to arms and, and shoulders. Um, you know, the thing that's challenging is I have a number of classmates or, or those that were in school with me that have already had shoulder replacements. And it is a lot of wear and tear on, on a veterinarian's um, body. And you can do that, you can do that for so long, but I do think there is a push um, for, for well-being. And we, we speak to that to our students that um, you have to be able to take care of your physical as well as your mental health. Um, when it comes to to your profession, and this is not a job that's particularly particularly easy all the time. Do injuries occur? Abs absolutely, um, but I think there is a is that continued effort to, as it's mentioned in the question, work smarter, not harder. I would I would think at least in the beef cattle industry. Uh, the dramatic improvement in dystocia that the industry has seen in the last 25 years would be helping to some extent because, uh, <clears throat> you know, those, I, I tell people, I, I was the herdsman at Montana State University. It's my job to get the heifers a long time ago, and it was a disaster. I didn't realize it at the time, but we had to call the veterinarian twice a week uh, to come out for a C-section. So hopefully that, that's one really positive story. Well, and I think as an industry, we have to work on that um, as, as a whole that, you know, even, even things that maybe we don't attribute to, to physical health, but docility in our, uh, ah, in our one. breeding herds is, yeah. is really, uh, it, it makes a difference on, um, for, for producers and veterinarians and, um, uh, you know, human safety is is really first and foremost. When when I go out, is uh, m my dad has a has a joke that um, the number one rule is he doesn't get hurt. So I just modified that a little bit. That number one rule is the veterinarian doesn't get hurt, and when the veterinarian says bail, you bail. So um, you can modify that for your particular operation, but um, I do think we're we're moving towards um, industry trends that that help us with that. Yeah, foot structure EPDs we talked about last week. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, a lot of that is gets back to hopefully that point came through as far as the animal husbandry 
piece um, and the improvements that, that we're trying to make um, to make us more successful and profitable as, as an industry. Um, there, there are lots of um, maybe non-monetary benefits um, to those things that, that can make a big difference. All right, have I missed any questions, Dr. Lawman? I don't think so. Okay. Well, with that, I wanna thank everybody that has, has joined us today. Um, all of, uh, all of you all um, from OSU Extension, I know we have a number of Extension educators that, that are with us on the line today. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for your support. And um, wanna thank uh, the group at the College of Veterinary Medicine, particularly Dr. Gillum and Dr. Jones for presenting uh, in this series. Uh, do want to invite you to um, join us for the next series, which is Cattle on Wheat and Small Grains that Dr. Beck is leading. I'm gonna put a couple of, um, well, probably like four, hopefully these will come through, um, links in, in the chat, just as a reminder. I would put that link to register for the, the series on, on wheat and small grains. Um, be sure and get registered for that starting next week. Uh, I know Dr. Beck's been, been working that, working that uh, program for, uh, for some time now, and I think it will prove, prove helpful. Also want to encourage you uh, when it comes to CFAP2 and, and beef production. If you missed Dr. Hagerman from Ag Econ's uh, recording on that program through Farm Service Agency, I've put that recording in the chat. We've got our extension podcast as well. Some great topics um, from our educators there that are worth taking a look at. And again, I think Marty, I think I caught it uh, out of the corner of my eye, but that extension treatment template uh, is available on that beef.okstate.edu uh, if you're interested in utilizing that for operations. And we are already talking about other, other templates that may prove um, helpful to you. So you might check back at, uh, at, our, at our website uh, in the future for, for options there. So with that, again, thanks to everyone that has helped us. Thanks for Dr. Lawman for, for leading the efforts on these webinar series. And um, we hope to hope to see you next week. Dr. Lawman, anything else? Nope. Very good. Very good All job. Right. Well, thanks see everybody for joining us and uh, wear orange tomorrow. Good idea.